Let me say good morning as well. And I am happy to be with you this morning, though I am reminded of the story, you know, of a church where they'd had a series of fill-in ministers doing the service, and the woman came up to him after he finished his service and, you know, shaking his hands and all, and said, Oh, thank you. You were so much better than the last guy who came. You know, he spoke for 40 minutes in that sermon, and it didn't say a thing. You did it in 15 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in any case, uh, I rejoice with you on <clears throat> Pentecost Sunday celebrating the Spirit of God moving in our lives and in our world and hopefully in our churches, inspiring us toward a future we don't yet know what that is. I invite you to join me in our call to worship. How great the mystery of faith, how deep the purposes of God in birth and aging, life and death, unveiled, yet never understood. The best that we can do and say, the utmost care of skill and art, are sweepers of the Spirit's way to reach the depths of every heart. Come walk among us, holy friend, as we are gathered and prepared that scattered lives may meet and bend and grace be shared. And will you join me in our invocation? O oh Lord, in this season of newness and green, we gather again seeking your grace. Wherever life has begun to overwhelm us and dreariness has become our companion, touch our souls with your life-renewing spirit. Let us feel the power of your presence and give us new strength for the tasks that are ahead. Wherever we have embraced resentment or bitterness, teach us the power of forgiveness for ourselves and for others. Help us to sense anew the joy of your call and your readiness to embrace us. Fill us with the hope you have for us. Amen. And our opening hymn is number 267 in your black hymnal.
I'm sorry, I did not know that hymn, so I... <laughs> um, I invite you to uh, pass the peace and greet each other in whatever way you feel comfortable this morning. Will you join with me in our prayer of confession and transformation? Today, gracious God, we remember and celebrate those saints of the past who came so alive in your spirit that they conquered an empire through your love. And we confess that we have been too wrapped up in our own needs, too content with the world as it is, to be emissaries of your hope. Forgive us for our weakness and our inconsistencies, and open us to the power of your spirit, that we might be made new. Let us hear your calling with new clarity and empower us to live vibrantly in your grace. Amen. The God of our faith is a loving God, ready to forgive those who sincerely confess their sins and failures, seeking to live truer and more faithful lives. The echo of Jesus' words, Father, forgive them stirs our hearts with promise. And now, do you have people you would like to uh, have lifted up to God in prayer from your community, among your family and friends? Uh, I invite you to mention those as we prepare to share in prayer together. Diane. Mm -hmm. I I do have hearing aids, but yeah. Okay, thank you, Jimmy. Marion. Nathan and family. David. Let's bow in prayer together. Holy God, we come to you on this Pentecost Sunday. We come to you out of a deep sense of need. We have lifted up these names to you, O oh God, Diane and Sandra and Jimmy and David and Marion and others we have uttered in our hearts and pray together that your grace will rest upon them today. May they be strengthened, may they feel the power of your healing touch their bodies, their minds and their souls to renew them and strengthen them and give them new life, O oh God. You know those unspoken needs and worries and concerns that trouble our own hearts. And we pray, O oh God, that your spirit might attend to those needs. Let your grace touch us with a deeper assurance of your love and your presence and guide us through the days that come. We pray for this church and your church universal, O oh God, 
We pray for your guidance for the future. Help us to find the way to let your spirit lead us and direct us and grow into a better future than even we can imagine. We pray for our nation and for the divisions and the animosity that sometimes builds. We pray for your spirit of wisdom to permeate minds and hearts and a new sense of our calling to be your people united, united in hope for the freedom and dignity of all people. We pray for our world, O oh God, especially this day. We pray for the people of Ukraine and the Middle East as they struggle in the midst of war and violence. So many lives lost, so many families disrupted. We pray, O oh God, for some hope that humanity might learn how to live together on this little earth you have given us. We pray for the future then, for our children and our children's children, that there might be a new beginning of peace and hope for the world. And we give you thanks for all the ways your spirit continues to move in our midst and to touch our lives, to bring us hope and strength and grace. Touch us anew and remind us that you are always with us. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Holy One, Open us to the mystery of your spirit, always to break into our lives. Give us vision to see where you would lead and the strength and wisdom to follow. Amen. And Deb is going to read our scripture. The scripture lesson this morning is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 12. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as a fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them the ability. Now there were devout Jews from every people under heaven, living in Jerusalem. 
And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear, each of us, in our own native languages? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phygaria, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? So ends this reading. Thank you, Bell Choir. Terrific. Most of us in the UCC don't quite know what to do with Pentecost, I think, beyond wearing, you know, red or something as a symbolic connection to those divided tongues of fire and the fire that's a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Uh, there are some denominations, uh, certainly, that get more fixated on the speaking in tongues uh, part of the story of Pentecost, uh, thinking sometimes that that was really the focus of the early church. It was not. Uh, when the Apostle Paul, you know, uh, writes of the gifts of the Spirit in chapter 12 of Corinthians, 
Uh, speaking in tongues is certainly listed as one of those gifts of the Spirit, but only along with several other things like knowledge, wisdom, uh, preaching, healing, miracles, even faith. Uh, Paul goes on to say that if there is no one there who can uh, translate or understand what someone is saying, it's better not to say it, you know, it makes no sense. Uh, in fact, you might say that speaking in different languages at Pentecost was as much a gift of understanding others as it was of how you speak. The miracle was that visitors from all over the empire to Jerusalem that day understood the disciples as if they were speaking in their own language. David Luce, uh, who's the former president of Lutheran Theological Seminary and chair of their preaching department, as well as an author, says there are two things to note about Pentecost, uh, one of which we get right for the most part, that is that it's the birthday of the church, uh, the, the time that the disciples became inspired by the power of God to begin preaching about the risen Christ. But, he says, here's what we get wrong. Pentecost didn't just happen once back there in the church's beginning. There are, in Luke's Acts, he says, multiple Pentecosts. M multiple times, that is, when the Spirit is poured out, amazing things happened, and people come to faith and to new life through that. It's not a once and done thing then. Naturally, he's not talking about ecstatic speaking where strangers who speak a different language understand what's being said as though everyone had, you know, just finished taking a multi-language uh, babble course. Uh, he's talking about that time when the Spirit of God seems to move into a situation and everything is transformed or becomes clear or richer or more energized in a positive and joyous way. Uh, think about when Philip baptizes the Ethiopian eunuch or Paul's transformative conversion himself, or, or Peter's conversion to a more universal understanding of Christianity through his dream and his baptism of a Roman uh, army officer, just to name of a few of those incidents that follow up this story in Acts. Each of these stories represents a repetition and an extension of the power of the Holy Spirit that starts at Pentecost, certainly, but continues throughout the history of the church down the line. And it doesn't stop in Acts, Dr. Luce suggests. There are a variety of episodes in the church's history that we might appropriately name as another Pentecost, the flourishing of the monastic communities of the Middle Ages, for instance, or the Reformation itself, or the revivals of the First and Second Great Awakenings in America. Those and more are all examples of God's Spirit moving in the midst of the world and changing things. No doubt there will be more. 
empowering the church to newness and greatness, you know, at this moment, of course, we're all facing the decline in membership among our churches, and we're all struggling with where, what's the future going to? But this Pentecost, you see, holds out to us that hope, that promise that God still can move in human life and in our church. It's not just big events. Pentecost happens in our local context as well. Whenever a church gets excited about some aspect of faith or some new aspect of ministry and is moved to reach out into the community of the world in some new way, that's also a Pentecost moment, Luz says. The Spirit is closely tied in Acts to love for one another in Christian community, a kind of coming together uh, that builds and empowers the faith community. The Holy Spirit is the glue that holds us together in ministry in our local situation. And the Holy Spirit moves the church out in ministry and mission and new life just as the disciples were moved out in Acts 2. Sometimes, of course, Pentecost can be seen in a more personal way when the Spirit of God moves in an individual's life to transform and empower and redeem and renew, that too is a kind of Pentecost. Edwina Gately uh, is a theologian and poet and a social worker who has been a teacher from the streets of Chicago all the way to Africa. Um, uh, I happened to note the other day that she celebrates her 81st birthday uh, tomorrow, and you know, I connected with that because I turned 81 in December myself. Uh, <clears throat> she wrote a story a while back about Pentecost in a very different way, you see, than, than Acts, but nonetheless an example of the power of the Spirit to transform. She says, I know someone who had a personal Pentecost experience, but it wasn't in an upper room, or any kind of room for that matter, it was a broom closet <laughs> in a homeless shelter in California. Her name was Breezy, a street name she was given because of the speed she moved from man to man working as a prostitute on the streets and down at the back alleys. 23 years of prostitution and drugs had left their mark on Breezy. Her face was scarred, her body battered, and her spirit really was dead. The broom closet was her own personal tomb, in a way. Breezy huddled within its cramped walls for three days and three nights. She had arrived, exhausted and beaten, to the shelter. It was full, so she crept into the closet where, as time passed, she was forgotten by the you know, busy, stressed out shelter staff. Three days she was there. Breezy had given birth three days earlier, you see. Her tiny daughter was born, shuddering and jaundiced with drugs. She was taken away by the hospital emergency staff, actually, to be given medical attention and placed for adoption because Breezy was not going to be able to take care of her. 
On the third day, Breezy awoke, hungry and devastated by the memory of the baby she had birthed and lost. In the cramped darkness of that closet, Breezy sobbed in shame and horror. Broken and helpless for the first time in many years, she began to pray. In between her sobs, she asked for forgiveness from God and forgiveness from her baby. And something happened in those moments. Maybe it was like a stone being rolled away. Maybe it was like a dense darkness being pierced by a brilliant light. Maybe it was a Pentecostal experience, a breaking through of energy and fire to a dead soul given new life. But something happened, and it was so powerful that Breezy crept out of the broom closet, determined to find her way back to home and Chicago and to live a different life. And she did. She sought counseling and healing and entered a program of recovery. It was a long and paced painful process of letting go of the past of 23 years of violence and drugs and prostitution. It was a difficult sorting out. There had to be some kind of funeral for Breezy, the staff decided with her. A funeral for the woman she had been and the only woman she knew. So staff and residents of the recovery program gathered in their small garden and standing in a circle, they dug a hole. They placed a, a rock uh, in it and bade farewell to Breezy bid farewell to the prostitute, the addict, and the convicted felon. And Breezy was buried. In that simple and symbolic ritual, Brenda was born, claiming her birth name again. She came into the dawn of a new life. It was to be a life full of the spirit it was to be a life led by God where Brenda would become a healer of those broken and battered as she had once been. It's an amazing story, you see, of grace and redemption and God's spirit pouring out in some unexpected way to touch a human life to bring renewal and hope where everything seemed to be lost. Pentecost is that mysterious life event after Easter when God's Spirit moved over the disciples and completed the transformation of their lives. But maybe more important, it's the moment God's spirit continues to invigorate and transform human lives again and again and again in every age. Pentecost finalizes the Easter season because believing in God's power in Jesus is not really the end and purpose of faith. Becoming alive in God's spirit is the important end of faith. And that's what moved the church out into the world. It was true both for the disciples and for us. At Pentecost, we are called to be awakened to God's redeeming grace 
for the world and for us to begin anew to participate in that grace. May God's spirit be with you and renew you uh, through the days that come. Will you join with me in our hymn number 377? And I actually, I think I know this one. So we come together in this place, celebrating our sense of community and our call to be the church in this new century, in this 2024 year. We come committing ourselves together in that faith. And our offering is one of the ways we make that commitment real as we pledge our financial resources to not only maintain this building and continuing having somebody up here, but also trying to reach out to the world with that hope that God's spirit is alive and that affirmation that God continues to renew human life. Let us take our morning offering.
Holy God, we give you thanks again. We pray that your spirit will be with us. Lord, we dedicate again this offering we bring, that our church might be a beacon of light and hope in our community. Let what we do here and what we give here reflect your love and redeeming grace. We pray that our church might truly serve in the name of Jesus. Amen. And our closing hymn is number 308 in the black hymnal. So now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. May God's Holy Spirit be alive in your midst and stir your hearts with that knowledge of God's love and God's embrace. And may God's continuing presence guide you in the living of your lives now and always. Amen and amen. <laughs>